You are watching Biography on A&E. I'm going to kill him. I'm really going to kill him. In October of 1962, the Merv Griffin Show debuted in the daytime on NBC. It was something still fairly new to TV, a combination talk and variety show. And it was a smash with critics. Merv was hailed as a master of this medium, one that brought the performing arts plus the art of conversation into the home. Now, for the first time in history, beginning with radio, you had uh, art brought into the house and a different kind of personality who could be intimate. And here was Merv Griffin, who had had a, uh, a middling career as a, a band singer and actor and so forth, but he had that quality. Merv, number one, had the prerequisite of all interviewers is the ability to listen. But despite the show's critical acclaim, the ratings were poor. NBC canceled the program in early 1963. In fact, he was out in the backyard burying the other night, dug down about 30 feet, and he met Jack Benny coming up. The audience, though, wouldn't say goodbye to Merv. Fans bombarded his production office with letters of support. NBC decided to take advantage of this. They offered him another game show to host. To sweeten the deal, they made him its producer, and Merv Griffin Productions was born. With a fledgling production company, Merv was now a businessman as well as an entertainer. And for Merv, producing a game show was a natural. And then there were always the times at home when we'd sit around on the floor at Merv's apartment in New York and play these funny games that he would make up. Still, it wasn't Merv who made up the game that became his biggest hit. It was his wife. While discussing the quiz show scandals that had rocked the television world in the late 1950s, Julian had a unique idea. She suggested they reverse the usual game show format, give the contestants the answer, and let them try to figure out the question. She gave me this reverse question thing, which then I took. I went into the office and got the staff. We did Jeopardy, Double Jeopardy, Final Jeopardy, and then you have to the Daily Double and all these th things. And we kept changing this around until I finally got the show that would play. In 1964, Jeopardy became a runaway hit. It was the centerpiece of Merv's company and made him a very rich and successful man. That same year, Merv joined up with Westinghouse. In February of 1965, he got a second chance to star in his own talk show. With the English actor Arthur Treacher as a sidekick, the Merv Griffin Show returned to the airwaves, and Merv picked up right where he'd left off, as confident and capable a host as ever. Everything all right? Yes. He's always been someone who was felt at home with anybody, everyone. I think that was the secret of his talk show. He wasn't trying to get a punchline, and he was always listening and, uh, and then letting you do the talk. What has the civil rights movement done to the Negro individually? And the people he was talking to were some of the most interesting and provocative people of the day. Though his show was a success this time around, it had its downside. Because of his hectic schedule, Merv was forced to spend more and more time away from Julianne and Tony. The Griffin's idyllic country life on the farm often went on without Merv. Oh, I just remember growing up was a very busy time for him. I was out fishing a lot, you know, a lot by myself and uh, with the neighbors. You know, there was a lot of pressure on him when I was growing up. He was, uh, he was working his tail off. In 1969, CBS convinced a reluctant Merv to bring his show to them. They wanted to put it into the toughest time slot on television, the late night spot opposite the highly successful Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. They offered him the unheard of salary of over $80,000 a week. They produced quirky ads to prime America for Merv's fall late-night debut. If you want to see what makes me so crazy about Merv, watch his new show on CBS, and you'll go crazy, too. 
The showdown proved to be difficult for everyone. With four popular shows all taping in the same town, it was all out war for guests. So Merv persuaded CBS to let him move his program to California, where he could go after more celebrities. In 1970, Merv headed to Los Angeles. But his decision greatly affected his family. The uprooting of their life concerned Julian, who was starting to feel somewhat abandoned and largely overshadowed by her husband's career. My mom and dad's uh, friends were all in New York. A lot of our family was in New York. And I think it just uh, changed their life, you know. Um, they grew apart a little bit. And uh, uh, I just think that they, they just had different interests. Merv's main interest was holding his own against Carson. And now that he was back in Hollywood, Merv could utilize his old ties and book some of the biggest people in show business. No. Money in your Oh, no, you? no. Money means nothing to me. If I don't get paid, I don't do it. The star-filled episodes brought good ratings, but turned some critics against Merv. He was ridiculed for not being tough enough with his guests. But his backslapping way remained popular and comforting with a wide range of viewers. I think what made him different is he seemed to care about the guests and what they did and was interested genuinely in their careers and had enthusiasm that I don't think you could feign for as many years as he was on the air. So his love of showbiz came through and his understanding of show business, I think, um, really showed as well. Merv also showed his skill for innovation. His became one of the first talk shows to leave the studio setting and go on the road. But the pressures of his work and the upheaval of the move west took a toll on his personal life. And the growing distance between Merv and Julianne grew into an irreconcilable gulf. She filed for divorce in the winter of 1973. I came home from school, my dad was home, and he's never home. And they were sitting out by the pool, and I went out to them and I said, Oh, did I break a window, or am I in trouble? And they go, No, you're not in trouble. I was trying to think of all the things, and they, they told me. And I rarely have seen my dad cry. It was very hard, and very hard on him. It was a little traumatic at that time for the boy and the wife, because everybody loved each other, but they were apart. I always felt that he never stopped loving his wife, and he never, of course, great with his son, the Griffin divorce was highly publicized. Merv had become quite a wealthy man as the head of a successful production company and the owner of radio stations and other ventures. Even as they hashed out a settlement, Merv and Julian remained on good terms, and together they concentrated on what was best for their son. They agreed to share responsibilities in raising him. He went through hell with it, but we both... You know, Julianne didn't hate me and I didn't hate Julianne. In fact, we were crazy about each other. And Tony was our prime concern. Merv spent as much time as possible with Tony. The two traveled all over the world together. They developed a tight bond. With his life now changed completely, Merv began to refocus on his career. Soon he embarked on a road that would make him not only one of the most powerful men in show business, but also one of the richest men in the world. In the 1970s, Merv Griffin was a household name. He was a famous interviewer, a newly single father, and his show seemed unstoppable. Though it was dropped by CBS, another big distributor picked it up instantly. Without missing an episode, Merv continued to produce a top-rated daily program. And he also started to expand his television empire. Merv surprised everybody by devising a show around the childhood game he'd loved, Hangman. It was interesting, he created that show while he was doing his own talk show. And he says, I think I'll call it Wheel of Fortune. He says, I see a stage full of prizes with cars and people come in and shop. 
They have to win money. They take that money and they turn around and shop. Wheel of Fortune became the second mega-hit game show for Merv Griffin Productions. In the mid-1980s, it dominated its time slot all over the country. Hosts Pat Sajak and Vanna White became stars themselves. And Vanna, with a unique sense of fashion, developed into a cultural icon. It was Merv Griffin himself who put Vanna White on the television map by picking her out at an audition. There were 200 other girls, and Merv made the final decision. I don't know why he chose me. I was probably the most nervous of all. Never get rid of Anna. I love her. Merv managed his growing empire with a relaxed yet controlling style. The once striving performer who'd cast about to find his way was now a powerful media mogul. It was clear he was running the show. No, you haven't. I guess he is a little intimidating at times, but, but I owe so much to him and, and feel so close to him uh, that I just feel like he's a good friend. By 1985, 60-year-old Merv Griffin was one of the richest men in the world. His company was raking in over $80 million from his shows. His personal fortune was estimated to be about $300 million. His lifestyle expanded with his wealth. He built and maintained several elegant and sprawling homes. Meanwhile, his interest in the daily talk show routine began to wane. I know he's said a million times, and he'll probably tell you, I've talked to everyone, I've asked every question I can think of a hundred times. What more can I ask? Who else can I interview? And I think he just kind of wound down. After 23 years on the air, Merv Griffin stepped down. The final broadcast aired on February 23rd, 1986. This is the first time on this last show I've ever said this. Um, we will not be right back after this message. Th 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 that's all, folks. Merv's new life as an entrepreneur soon began. In December of 1986, in one of the biggest deals of the 80s, Coca-Cola bought Merv's company for a reported $250 million. Merv moved into the hotel business, purchasing the Beverly Hilton Hotel the following year. And his personal life also took a new turn. He was now seen around town with actress Ava Gabor, known to most people as the wife from the TV series Green Acres. And they had a nine-year relationship, and she went everywhere with us. He built a, a, a room onto the, a couple of houses that, uh, for Ava. He always had, you know, the best seat in the house for Ava. And she was a lot of fun. She's a great lady. They were a high-profile couple who traveled all over the world and in the elite Hollywood circles. They described their relationship as close and loving. He is as funny as they come. He and I are George Byrne and Gracie Allen. And we laugh. I have never laughed so much in my life than I laugh with Merv. With tears, I laugh. She is, at this time, the dearest lady in my life. She's just the sweetest, most joyful, most sensitive, wonderful woman you'd ever want to know. It was with Ava by his side that Merv plunged into the biggest corporate gamble of his career. In 1988, he engaged Donald Trump in a battle for control of the hotel and casino chain, Resorts International. It was a battle. It was a challenge. And it was nip and tuck. And he was against a, a pretty good foe, Donald Trump. Uh, but he, I think he loved every moment of it. The press followed the two titans every move. Merv offered a fortune for the chain. How much do I owe him? <laughs> Trump fought to retain it. Their drawn-out battle ended, with Merv finally getting what he wanted, but Trump was perceived as the true victor. He paid me a tremendous amount of money for resorts. I don't know why he paid that price. I don't know why he paid as much as he did. Now, I hope it works out okay for him. I don't believe it can work out well for him. I hope it works out okay for him. Merv now owned the Resorts Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City, acres of undeveloped land near the boardwalk, and almost all of Paradise Island in the Bahamas. 
It was so wonderful on Paradise Island. We got into a car and they said, now that's yours, Mr. Griffin, that's yours, that's yours. Do you see this tree? It's mine. <laughs> Merv's rival wasn't so sure the former showman knew what he'd gotten into. Essentially what he has is an old casino in Atlantic City that needs tremendous amount of money and tremendous amount of work and an old casino in Paradise Island. He wants to be perceived as a winner. I say, who cares? Uh, let him, you know, want, let him uh, have that if he wants that. But I say we both won. He got what he wanted, I got what I wanted, and that's it. Merv Griffin had taken on America's most famous tycoon, and he would eventually emerge a winner. And as the years rolled on, he seemed to be able to do anything he wanted. But what he didn't want or expect was the sudden hint of scandal that was about to swirl around. In 1991, Merv Griffin came under attack. Two former employees filed suit against him. One by Brent Plott, Merv's former horse trainer and bodyguard, was a $200 million palimony suit. It alleged Merv had promised to support him for life. In an interview, Plott claimed that he had lived with Merv for years and had been his close advisor and lover. There are allegations in the complaint that the two lived together in the same house for a number of years. Now, any American, uh, educated or uneducated, can draw what they want from that. Later that year, a second suit was filed by Denny Terrio, the former host of one of Merv's shows, Dance Fever. He charged he'd been fired from the show for refusing Merv's sexual advances. Merv, denouncing both claims as bogus and absurd, went to court prepared to fight. Eventually, both cases were dismissed. And we went to court, nobody ever showed up. So whatever case came, they're just dismissed. We don't know, where are they? No one ever showed up, so they're dismissed with prejudice, which is really interesting. It means that you can't even try them again. They were, you know, they were like scams. But now, rumors and questions circulated around Hollywood about Merv's private life. Merv being gay? One of the reasons I liked to hang out with Merv was he always had the most beautiful women around him. I would be backstage with him. I've been to so many places. There's no way I could believe it. I've never seen any indication of it. But true to his unflappable nature, Merv, at least publicly, refused to let the rumors disturb him. You could say what you want. You can try to hurt his feelings. You can hurt his feelings. But, and, and those times, uh, there were times when they did hurt his feelings. He doesn't dwell in that because he's not a negative person. My father is uh, very positive. In July of 1995, Merv's upbeat nature was put to the test. His longtime companion, Eva Gabor, died. Merv was despondent, but publicly put on a good face. Even his family was not allowed to share the full extent of his grief. And I know it affected him and it hurt him. And uh, we talk about her and we make speeches about her and we make toasts to her. And part of his sorrow for Eva, I'll, I'll never know. After Ava's death, Merv, in 1996, sold the gambling side of his company to Sun International for an estimated $250 million. Though it meant turning over his hard-won resorts chain, it made him money and once again proved Merv's mettle as an entrepreneur. That same year, Merv received some frightening personal news. He was diagnosed with prostate cancer. He asked me to print the story so that people would know what he was going through and how he was approaching it with a very, very positive attitude. He was confident from the very first time he was told. I had a very odd reaction to cancer. I ignored it. It didn't upset me or anything. I went, oh, another humiliation. No, another glitz in my life. 
Merv decided to undergo radiation treatment, which he would have to endure for seven weeks, five days a week. And after his treatments, Merv's doctors announced his cancer was in remission. This one here is a, uh, a little baby that's a yearling. Merv immediately resumed his life. He immersed himself in the luxurious and profitable empire he had created from his years of exploring and then conquering the vast and varied world of entertainment. As the ultimate showman, he trooped his way through every setback and success, whether personal or professional. He said in a couple interviews that he regretted doing the resorts deal, but I don't believe that now because he took a, he took a risk and uh, I bet it's paid off. He has the Midas touch. He doesn't miss, I mean, he doesn't miss. He knows how to, how to really enjoy life. He totally uh, enjoys what he's, what he's doing. Uh, and I think one of the reasons is <laughs> everything he does seems to be so successful. You know, he did it in a world after everything had been discovered and done. There's no more oil, there was no more land, there's no more big killings to be made, like the Rockefellers and the Astors. When Mr. Griffin came along, he found a new way to become a billionaire. When I thought of doing a talk show, I thought of taking exactly what he did and doing it for the 90s. That's the silliest question. <laughs> He wouldn't put anyone down. He would sort of celebrate showbiz. And when you were watching at home, you felt like everyone was his friend. Even though he has a lot of money, oh, stop. he never flaunted it. He is just Thank the most wonderful, down-to-earth, charming person to be with. If you ever want a friend, a true friend, uh, get to know Mel Griffin. To use the cliche of the pebble in the pond, the ripple effect, and it just goes on and on. Probably thousands of people have been affected by the fact that Merck is on this earth. It's been a busy year for Merv Griffin. In his role as a television visionary, he's created a game show called Click, aimed at a younger audience. It's basically Jeopardy played at warp speed with teenage contestants running and answering questions. As a hotel tycoon, he has opened a new supper club at his Beverly Hilton Hotel. It's called the Coconut Club, in honor of his biggest hit, I've Got a Lovely Bunch of Coconuts. The club and its swing bands has become one of the hottest night spots in Southern California. And as an entertainer, Griffin is recording his first album in two decades, which he calls romantic music for After Midnight. Tomorrow, Don Imus, the antithesis of Merv Griffin, but every bit the pioneer. It was Imus who deserves much of the credit or the blame for today's talk radio. The so-called shock jock is now approaching 60, but he's as shocking as ever. Don Imus, when Can We Talk Week continues Wednesday. Until tomorrow, for a and &E, I'm Peter Graves. Thanks for joining us. Now you can subscribe to Biography Magazine for almost 50% off the newsstand price. 12 issues for only $18. Call 1-800-901-2233 to order Biography Magazine. Now, in the most violent tornado season in decades, one twister tore a path through the heart of Nashville, Tennessee. On an all-new Inside Story, next on A&E.